Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all our Princeton alumni and spouses. It's really an honor and a delight to have you back on campus at your alma mater. Uh, I'm Robert George. I am the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions here at Princeton. Uh, thank you. Uh, as uh, some of you just proved with that very generous and kind of applause, uh, many of you are friends and supporters of the Madison program, and uh, from the bottom of my heart, I cannot thank you enough for what you have done for us and what you are doing for us. Uh, for those who happen not to be familiar with the Madison program, we are a program under the auspices of the Department of Politics here at Princeton. We were founded in the year 2000, so we're in our 23rd year now, which is amazing for me to uh, think about it. And our mission is to help our young men and women, help our students to explore the enduring questions of American constitutional law and Western political thought. James Madison famously said that only a well-instructed people can be permanently a free people. And of course, that makes sense the minute you think about it. We are, after all, what our founders called a republic. People sometimes today say democracy, but our founders called us a republic. And whichever term you use, the idea is the people govern themselves. Lincoln spoke, as you'll recall, at Gettysburg of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, of course, all government is government of the people. All good government But if we are to be a self-governing people, if any people is to be a self-governing people, then the people need to know how their own civic institutions work. They need to know what their rights are, what we call constitutional rights are, what their duties are, their constitutional duties are. They need to have some understanding of what that good old-fashioned term civics used to mean. So civic education is a critical dimension of citizenship for citizens of a republic. And so the Madison program is dedicated to exploring these enduring questions so that our students will be good republic, small r, good republican, or if you prefer democratic, small d, citizens, mm -hmm. so that they can govern themselves and we can continue this magnificent experiment in republican government and ordered liberty that was bequeathed to us uh, by the great men who founded this country. You can learn more about what we do at uh, jmp.princeton.edu, our website. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me or any member of uh, my staff about the Madison program. We can tell you more about it. Um, because this is 2023, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and, and whatever has yesterday displaced Facebook and Twitter. I know there's always a, a new one. <laughs> Uh, and at our website, you can also sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to our wonderful Madison's Notes podcast. This being 2023, you have to have a podcast. And we've got a great podcast. Uh, our podcaster is our staff member, wonderful staff member, Annika Nordquist, who interviews fascinating people about questions of uh, civic life. And at our website, you can learn more about our uh, upcoming events, both virtual uh, and in person. Now for our program today, when professions go woke, can dissenters survive? Is there a word to describe the attitude of a person who regards his or her opinions as so obviously correct and so profoundly enlightened that those opinions may not legitimately be challenged or questioned and that only hate or bigotry can explain other people's holding different beliefs. Sure there is such a word. That word is woke. Now, of course, it's a contested word. And the word, even as a slang term, did not always have those connotations of intolerance. These, these days, the connotations of the term are mainly negative. I think that's fair to say. It's now mostly used pejoratively by critics 
of people who say that these other people are woke. But it didn't actually begin that way. The word began with people who believed in racial justice and prioritizing the elimination of racial discrimination and other forms of injustice, applying it to themselves, the term woke to themselves, and to those who shared their beliefs and principles. They had a slogan, stay woke. It was broadened, however, to be a term that applied to those who held ultra-progressive or left-wing ideas generally about not only race, but especially about sexuality and gender. For the woke, anti-racism is not the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King. It is the ideology of Professor Ibrahim X. Kendi. And gender ideology of the sort that constructs and sacralizes innumerable gender identities is an unquestionable dogma. Those holding these beliefs themselves embraced the term woke until their critics, a coalition of conservatives like me and old school liberals like the comedian Bill Maher, began following their linguistic practice and referring to them and their ideology as woke. Soon the term had become almost an epithet, and nobody wanted to be labeled woke. Now mind you, their views didn't change, nor their aggressiveness in asserting them and in labeling people who don't share them as racists, homophobes, bigots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they are no longer accepted, they no longer accepted the term and began charging anyone who used it, the term woke, and referring to them as, yes, you guessed it, racists, homophobes, bigots, et cetera. Now, it's a free country, thank God. You are free not to use the term woke, but others are free to use it. You are free to criticize those who use it, but they are free to criticize you. That's what it means to be a free country. I'll explain this to people these days. The free country, both sides get freedom. That's the idea. I can criticize you, you can criticize me. I know, complicated concept, but <laughs> you criticize me. Now we're using the term for this panel, it's right there in the title, because we're interested in the phenomenon for which it has become a label, an ideology, a set of beliefs that its partisans regard as so enlightened that it may not legitimately be questioned, and as so obviously correct that any dissent from it can only be explained as a manifestation of hatred and bigotry. So what do you do, and this is the question for the day, question for the panel, what do you do if you're a dissenter? You're not buying the ideology, but your profession or your organization, your law firm, your university, the newspaper you work for, if your name is Barry Weiss, has gone woke. In the face of intolerance of your opinions, is it possible for you to survive without either capitulating to the ideology or just going silent and hiding? That's the question that we've asked our very distinguished panelists to address. I'll present them, I'll introduce them in the order in which they will give brief opening remarks and then we're gonna have a discussion up here and then if there's time, we'll open it for Q&A. Dr. Kristen Collier is Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Michigan. Her areas of interest include preventative medicine, primary care, depression, and heart disease. She's herself a graduate of the University of Michigan uh, Medical School. And since uh, Kristen is not a Princeton alumna, I'm especially grateful to her for coming to be part of our Thanks. panel. She's someone I wanted Thanks for on having the panel me. Very Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now for my kids. <laughs> Joelle Alessia was graduated from Princeton Summa Cum Laude and Phi Beta Kappa in 2010. He went on to Harvard Law School and then to clerkships on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the Supreme Court of the United States. He practiced law for several years with the firm of Cooper and Kirk in Washington, DC. And he's now professor at the Columbus School of Law of the Catholic University of America. Ramesh Panuru was graduated from Princeton Summa Cum Laude in 1995. He went on to work at National Review Magazine, of which he is now the editor. 
He's also a senior fellow of the American Enterprise Institute and a contributing columnist at the Washington Post. And Ryan Anderson, after graduating from Princeton Magna Cum Laude and Phi Beta Kappa in 2004, went on to the University of Notre Dame, where he completed his PhD in political theory. He worked at First Things Magazine and then founded Public Discourse, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute here in Princeton. Today, Ryan is the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Please join me in welcoming our panel and Mr. Carter over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you for that kind introduction, Professor George. And I'm really grateful for the organizing committee for having an outsider join you today for this really important conversation. So I hold a very controversial opinion in the profession of medicine right now. What is that opinion? That directly aiming at the death of another member of the human family, whether young or old, should not be considered healthcare. As Professor George mentioned in my introduction, I'm a medical doctor, someone who took an oath upon graduation from med school back in 2001 to do no harm. And someone now in 2023 who still believes in that oath and firmly believes that killing another human being is antithetical to the good practice of medicine. With this, I'm considered a dissenter from mainstream academic medicine. That's really all I need to say. I could end my remarks here, as that's really all you need to know and ponder, but alas, I've been asked to speak for 10 minutes and in my short time. Uh, I will share what I learned this year when my controversial views made national headlines and what might be done to ensure that the sacred vocation of medicine doesn't completely lose its way by becoming entangled with the business of death. So about a year ago, I was emailed by our dean's office at the medical school that I had been chosen by vote by our medical school's chapter of the Gold Humanism Honor Society to be the keynote physician speaker for our medical school's white coat ceremony that was to be held in late July. And this is really one of the biggest honors that our faculty can have because it's even a bigger honor than the graduation keynote because you're like the first physician to welcome the brand new med students into the vocation. So I knew what an honor it was having graduated from this medical school myself and I quickly and joyfully accepted. Within about two weeks, the Dobbs decision came down and on that same day, an interview I did with Professor Charles Camosi for the Catholic website The Pillar came out about how I am both a Christian and a pro-life convert recently and it was published. So emotions were really high around our medical center around abortion as I know they were at various points in the country and in my interview for The Pillar, I discuss, as I have on other platforms, my view on abortion and physician-assisted suicide euthanasia, and how I do not believe that taking the life of another human being should be considered healthcare. Well, within a couple weeks, I started to hear that there might be some rumblings at the medical school, that people were unhappy with my being chosen as the white coat speaker because of my position on abortion. And I soon got a call from the dean's office that a petition had been started to have me removed as the speaker and was signed by some incoming students, current students, some alumni, and even some faculty and staff. And at the end of the petition, it said, we demand that the University of Michigan support reproductive justice. We demand that the University of Michigan listen to our voices and we demand an alternative speaker for this year's white coat ceremony with duplicate and triplicate exclamation points. So the local news started carrying the story and it was a really stressful time. I continued to go to work and the timing fell during a time when I was teaching a pretty intensive week-long course with a group of first-year students, many of them who I knew had signed the petition. And every day I walked to my class, I passed by a sign that had been hanging up for months on a bulletin board at the med school posted by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office. And it said, every voice counts. It said, every voice counts. Our community depends on it. So it got me wondering, does every voice indeed count? Or are these just words on a sign? What about my voice? Did this not apply to me? I felt that I was being faced with an identity-based attack. I wasn't even going to be speaking about abortion at the white coat ceremony. All I had done was accept an invitation given to me to welcome the new medical students. But because of my identity of who I was and what I believed that flowed in part out of my Christian beliefs, I was being targeted. I knew I had a right to speak, 
and that our faculty handbook at Michigan supported me having views on contested issues. So chapter one is titled Fundamental Tenets of Membership in the University Community. It says, expression of diverse points of view is of the highest importance, not only for those who espouse a cause or a position and then defend it, but also for those who hear and pass judgment on that defense. The belief that an opinion is pernicious, false, or in any other way detestable cannot be grounds for its suppression." End quote. But yet here I was. I had phone calls almost every 48 hours with a member of the dean's office about the situation. They wanted to know if I wanted to step down from the talk. I asked if the decision was going to remain mine. And I was told that if the security issues around the talk became too much, the dean had the right to cancel my appearance. Every time I said, I want to speak, I called upon my crew of people, not only at Michigan, but across the country, and had people praying for me, writing letters, and navigating conversations at levels that I really could not And in the end, the administration did the right thing. They supported my invitation to talk and publicly said so through an email to all the faculty and staff at the medical school. The email was sent by our dean, Dr. Marshall Runge, and it said, Kristen Hall, your MD, was chosen as the keynote speaker for the 2022 White Coat Ceremony based on nominations and voting by members of the U of M Medical School Gold Humanism Honor Society, which is comprised of med students, house officers, and faculty. And this society chapter, which was formed at U of M in 2016, represents exemplars of humanistic patient care and who serve as role models, mentors, and leaders in medicine. We have received both positive and negative feedback on the choice of our keynote speaker, but the White Coat Ceremony is not a platform for a discussion of controversial issues, and Dr. Collier never planned to address a divisive topic as part of her remarks. Our values speak about honoring the critical importance of diversity of personal thought and ideas, which is foundational to academic freedom and excellence. We would not revoke, revoke a speaker because they have different personal views and ideas than others." End quote. So after that, I was invited to all the White Coat planning meetings. I was assigned a bodyguard for the ceremony. They increased the security presence at the event. We had a plan for every possible scenario as we were told there was gonna be some disruption by the students, but we really didn't know what it was gonna be. And the day of, as, as many of you know, at the beginning of my remarks, several audience members, including students, got up and walked out. And someone in the audience recorded it and the video of that night started going viral on social media. So my husband, Tim, woke me up the next morning saying, Kristen, it's the top story on Fox News. And every, every major news outlet started carrying the story. And the next several days really were a blur. Um, death threats, media requests, they got a hold of my phone and Tim's phone. I was told to drive a different way to work and to park in a different spot, alert the neighbors, the whole nine yards. The fact that I had to have a bodyguard and had death threats for standing up for life as a physician in medicine shows just how far adrift the culture around medicine has become. So yes, I am a dissenter. But the question that's posed for our time together is, can, it, can dissenters survive? Well, the answer in my case, and with many others, is yet to be determined. In my case, I don't have tenure. My educational, administrative, and leadership roles all have the potential of being taken away. And although I bleed maize and blue, and value and treasure those roles very much, and am well qualified and have demonstrated excellence in these roles. As a Christian, I'm thankful that my identity is rooted in something larger than my work and even larger than myself, and that can never be taken away from me, thank God, as my identity is rooted in Jesus Christ. I have been outed in a very public way at my place, and even though I, I'm t I was tempted to defend myself in all the media requests that I received or by taking up an offer to write various op-eds, I didn't. You won't find me in any news media clips after the white coat ceremony talking about my side of the story. I just let my work speak for itself. That perhaps is my first piece of advice here. Let your good work speak for itself. For example, when NPR contacted me for a comment on the story and I declined, they likely sent some intern to go find something on me to put in the piece, and this is what they published. Quote, Collier is a frequent speaker and panelist on issues of bioethics and the role of spirituality and religion in healthcare. On her Twitter, she's written about racism, ageism, and ableism in medicine, and advocates for better healthcare access for incarcerated people and residents of rural America, end quote. Like, that's so much better than anything I could have ever said to defend myself. <laughs> so again, let your work speak for itself. My second piece of advice on surviving as a dissenter is to grow, cultivate, and build your network of what I call friendlies. 
I know that I wouldn't have been able to survive the stress of this whole ideal without my network of supporters, not only at my place, but also from across the country, who gave me counsel advice and again helped navigate pretty critical conversations. And then comes the philosophical musing, are the centers even worth it? I.e., are they valuable in some way to the work that's to be done in the field in question? Well, in my case, in the vocation of medicine, I strongly believe that if we lose the dissenters, especially at our large public institutions that we so dearly love, those for whom the inherent worth and inviolable dignity of every human being is worth protecting and fighting for, then I believe a great tragedy will ensue. But as you all know, there are strong callings to exile and cancel those of us who hold such views in medicine, with research showing that applicants who hold views would be subject to discrimination when applying for residency training in fields like obstetrics and gynecology, for example. We need to continue to call out the hypocrisy of the DEI movement that's not truly inclusive, especially for those in medicine who hold religious and spiritual commitments, especially when we know many people go into medicine because of these commitments and that these commitments can protect them against burnout as they are a way to make meaning in our vocational work. And once we call it out sufficiently, work to reform it. And we need to continue to fight and preserve dearly for physician conscience and laws that protect the rights of physicians to opt out of procedures and treatments that are an affront to their conscience. Physician conscience is the most valuable tool that we have and we should reframe it as such. And finally, we need to reimagine what kind of educational system reform might look like that protects learners from becoming the type of person who can't sit with someone else who holds a different view than they do, especially in one that involves ideological difference across a contested issue. The future of our great universities and its learners depend on this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Collier. Um, after the panel, could I get a tutorial from you on how to say no when hostile media ask for a comment? <laughs> <laughs> My wife would really thank you if you could teach me to say no. Uh, now, uh, please welcome Joelle Alessia. Joelle. Thank you, Professor George. Thanks to the Madison program for inviting me to be here. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here under the auspices of the Madison program, of which I was an undergraduate fellow during my time here at Princeton, and to be uh, part of this panel of such distinguished uh, speakers and to follow such eloquent remarks um, as we just heard. I think my role here is to talk about the state of wokeness in the legal profession, both in terms of legal practice and academia, since I've been in both uh, uh, realms of the legal profession. And the bottom line conclusion that I'm going to uh, come to is that the legal profession is, uh, has been deeply infected by wokeness and there's a lot of uh, reason for concern, but that actually there are dynamics within the profession of law in particular that give us some reason for hope uh, that might not apply more broadly to some other professions. So just to start out with a sense of the problem that we have, and I think I'll just illustrate that with a couple of uh, vignettes, a couple of stories that we've seen in just the last year or so. On the legal practitioner side, so we're talking about major law firms, right? Uh, last summer, the US Supreme Court issued its decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. This is a decision that held that under the Second Amendment, citizens have the right to carry firearms outside the home for self-defense. There could be regulations of the right to carry, but any such regulations have to be grounded in a historical tradition of regulation, and that in no case can you completely prohibit the, the right to carry outside the home for self-defense, for law-abiding law citizens at least. And that decision, uh, in, at least in my view, and I think in the view of a lot of commentators, really does follow from the court's decisions in District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008, McDonald versus Chicago in 2010, uh, and the general approach to jurisprudence that this Supreme Court majority has, one that, is, that emphasizes the text and history of the Constitution. So the result in Bruin I don't think was terribly surprising, uh, and it is certainly well within the range of reasonable views of, about Second Amendment jurisprudence. The firm that argued that case 
Kirkland and Ellis, uh, the partner who specifically argued it, Paul Clement, uh, ended up parting ways with each other after that decision, the day of that decision, actually, when Kirkland and Ellis gave Paul Clement, uh, who is one of the greatest Supreme Court advocates, uh, certainly of his generation, arguably in the history of the US Supreme Court, uh, Kirkland gave Paul Clement uh, the ultimatum of either agreeing to completely sever his connections with his clients relating to the Second Amendment uh, or to leave the firm. Uh, because Kirkland was dropping all of those clients in light of what just happened in Bruin. And uh, Clement, to his great credit, for the second time, and I won't talk about the first time here, but for the second time, uh, opted to just leave the firm and start his own uh, small law firm, Clement and Murphy, and continue to represent clients uh, on Second Amendment matters. So because a partner at the firm who was one of, who's one of their most prominent, if not their most prominent uh, practitioners, and as I said, one of the greatest practitioners at the Supreme Court ever, uh, because he was involved in winning a, a case on behalf of a completely mainstream, reasonable view, uh, that was sufficient for Kirkland to be willing to terminate its relationship um, with him. I should say terminate the relationship, I don't mean he was terminated, I mean willing to, to end it, to, to give him the choice of leaving, and he left on, on his own terms. Um, second anecdote, and you all might have heard of this probably because it broke through to mainstream media. Uh, it was only last March, a, a, few, a couple months ago, that a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, Kyle Duncan, was scheduled to give a talk at Stanford Law School uh, and so here we're crossing over into academia, right? We're just about practice, now into academia. Uh, and was unable to deliver those remarks because of the vile and vicious uh, slanders thrown at him by the students in uh, that law school and at, who were attending this talk, who were shouting so, uh, so loudly and so viciously uh, that he could not continue and he was not allowed to speak. Uh, this was backed up, of course, by the dean, the assist, associate dean who was there, um, who's in charge of the sort of DEI type of office at Stanford Law School, um, who uh, took the side of the protesters in that confrontation against Judge Duncan in that moment. Judge Duncan, by the way, was not there to talk about anything uh, relating to you know, abortion or, some, or his own views on those questions. Right? He was actually there to give a talk about the ways in which some emergency litigation going up through the Fifth Circuit uh, had interacted with Supreme Court jurisprudence. Really important, very timely topic. You could learn a lot from that without having any views on you know, abortion or, or same-sex marriage or anything like that. Didn't matter, uh, he was not allowed to, to speak. Now you might say, after those two anecdotes, well those are anecdotes uh, and that doesn't necessarily prove anything, but I wanna underscore the, the features of these two uh, individuals who were uh, you could say canceled in this way, right? One was one of the greatest Supreme Court advocates ever. And the other is a sitting judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. So consider that a major law firm was willing to do that to that kind of advocate, and this law school was willing to do this to a sitting US Court of Appeals judge. And now think about what does that mean for a law firm associate at that law firm who has no power or a student, a 1L, first year law student at, at Stanford Law School who also has no power and whose future, in both, in both of those instances, their futures are in the hands of people who agree with the protesters, right? Uh, so yes, those are anecdotes, but they signal a, a power dynamic and a level of hostility and a, and a boldness on the part of uh, those uh, who share this woke ideology that that filters a message down through the ranks of those law firms and through the ranks of the law schools that is very much received by associates and law students. And they understand uh, that they have to, uh, or at least they don't have to, and nor do I think they should, but that at least they think they have to self-censor uh, to avoid these kinds of consequences. Now that sounds really bad, and you might be thinking, well, he said that things weren't that bad in the legal profession, so how could that be the case? Well, there's, there's a dynamic that's at place, that, that takes place in the legal profession that isn't true, perhaps, in some others. And that is that uh, in the law, clients want to win. 
and they pay to win, right? And it turns out that who decides whether you win is not DEI administrators. It's judges like Kyle Duncan on the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. So because, they're, because judges in our system are appointed, at least at the federal level, are appointed through a political process, and that political process is responsive to the common sense of the American people, uh, those judges tend not to share the ideology of uh, those protesters at Stanford Law School or uh, the law firm partners, apparently, at Kirkland and Ellis. And that means that if you want to win uh, those lawsuits, you have to know how to articulate legal arguments to an audience of judges who do not share that kind of woke ideology. And that creates an inherent check on how far the ideology can really filter down. Because if the law schools are only producing people who think like the protesters at Stanford, those will be bad lawyers. Those lawyers will not know how to articulate legal arguments to an audience that doesn't agree with them. They won't understand the fullness of the arguments on both sides. Uh, and that means that their clients are not going to win. Uh, and at some point, the same thing will be true of these law firms. To the extent that they start uh, uh, severing ties with their very top advocates uh, because those advocates don't share their uh, woke views, that will hurt them in terms of their competitiveness within the marketplace for legal representation that is effective. Uh, and you've seen this with the flight of several litigators from places like Kirkland to smaller firms so Clement and Murphy, they started their own firm. The firm I worked at and still work at on the side, Cooper and Kirk, small firm that started in the mid-90s, so way before this whole trend. Uh, but those, those firms are now kind of uh, alternative institutions that allow for some of these, these very talented people to go someplace where they're not going to be censored uh, due to their, their views. But that also means that clients who are unpopular can go to those types of firms uh, for uh, representation, effective representation. Uh, and so I, I, I would just close by saying that uh, the situation, as those two anecdotes shows, is quite bad uh, in the legal profession at the moment. But I am cautiously optimistic that unlike, say, a department of sociology, which could be completely captured uh, by a woke ideology and it would not necessarily get checked by some sort of outside external uh, incentive. In the legal profession, there are outside external uh, incentives that come fr from the political process um, and the common sense of the American people. My hope is that over time, uh, both the legal profession in terms of large scale law firms, but also the law schools that produce the lawyers for those firms, will through their own self-interest, their financial self-interest, uh, if not through conversion, uh, come to abandon at least the worst excesses of that ideology. Thank you. So we can talk about this a bit uh, at the end, but uh, the thing that struck me as so amazing about Paul Clement's case at, uh, at Kirkland, uh, Mr. Alisea mentioned that the separation of Mr. Clement from his firm happened the day the Supreme Court handed down the decision in which Paul won, right. is that had he lost, he wouldn't have been separated from the firm. He was separated for, for winning. You know, the job of the lawyer is what? To win? <laughs> uh-uh. Had he lost, he'd be at Kirkland and Ellis right now. Ramez Panero. The, uh First thing I need to say is thank you to, for, uh, for having me. Thank you for running the Madison program and making it such a great force uh, on this campus and really in this country. And thank you all for, uh, for packing the house. That's, uh, that's lovely to see. Um, I have to, I can't let it pass though that, uh, that Robbie started off the remarks by saying, uh, you know, even the government of a benign despot is for the people. And I thought, I have finally found the perfect description of how he runs his classes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the story of Paul Clement, on the other hand, reminds me of a, of a line, I think it may have been Pat Sajak said it in the 80s, about being a conservative in Hollywood. Uh, it's lonely 
but you have a one in three chance of becoming president of the United States. <laughs> uh, so the, the phenomenon of, of wokeness that uh, we've been talking about and its deforming effects on various professions and, and really their ability to do what the professions are called to do is a very real one. Um, it is a problem from which I personally am pretty well insulated. I have made um, all my career, my main home is a place that exists to foster conservative viewpoints, to foster and promote them. And we have certainly felt certain kinds of pressures based on the things we say. Um, I, it has often struck me that, uh, although I'm perfectly happy with, with, with how my career has been going, um, I could have, I've turned down some lucrative opportunities by not being either more pro-Trump or more anti-Trump than I am. Uh, I, uh, so some people seem to have made a mint out of, uh, out of making either of those things their, their, their basic identities. Um, that doesn't seem all that enviable position to, to, to take. Uh, I have also, however, been um, a participant in opinion journalism in the mainstream media. I had a column with Bloomberg Opinion for 11 years, and starting in January, I've been writing for the Washington Post, and I go on CNN and, and even for my sins, MSNBC, sometimes. Um, actually, my, uh, my four-year-old um, apparently last night said uh, to his sister, CNN is not a good show if daddy's not on it. <laughs> and uh, I quoted that to Robbie, and, and he agrees. So, uh, so um, I do have a f just a few thoughts about um, making in this world. Uh, I should bracket it off, though, by saying I think in opinion journalism in particular, in an odd way, some of those old norms of fair debate uh, and viewpoint diversity are, if not exactly thriving, um, they're, they're surviving, they're healthier than they are in some other sectors of our, uh, our country. I think you can say things um, as a conservative on CNN that you might not be able to say in every boardroom in our country, um, which is a kind of odd inversion of, of, uh, of the way things used to be. Uh, and I also think that a lot of the problems we're seeing in journalism have to do with the inability, yes, the problems of journalism are very troubling indeed, um, have to do with the failure to find a viable economic model for high quality journalism. Um, I've, it's often struck me that journalism is, is the one declining industry that isn't part of Trump's base. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about the Washington Post um, hiring of a columnist like me, there are, you know, there's, a, there's a, a sector of Twitter that was displeased by this personnel decision and made their views known, and they were saying, well, this is just, uh, you know, they're just trying to, to make money. And uh, I think actually the profit maximizing thing for the Washington Post to do would be to completely and 100% lean into being a resistance left publication. And they keep people like me around because there's sense, there are still people there who have a sense that we need to air all points of view and not uh, because they want to make money out of it. Um, which on the one hand is a good thing, but on the other hand tells you something I think about the economic pressures um, facing the industry and, uh, and the difficulty of sustaining um, that viable model. If you do ever find yourself uh, in the position of, uh, of being on one of these shows or being in this kind of mainstream uh, media environment and you're a conservative who dissents on a large number of issues, uh, the only advice I would have to give you was well, a few pieces of advice. One would be uh, not to flinch. Um, don't, uh, so, you know, at Bloomberg uh, and at the Washington Post, um, I have not trimmed my sails on any of the things I think about 
uh, the right to own guns or the right to life or immigration or you know just go down the list of issues. Um, I think that one should, in presenting a point of view, try to take on the best arguments from the other side, sort of present the best arguments against the best arguments on the other side. It's certainly possible to, to do this job in a different way than that. Uh, I also think it's important to tell your audiences sometimes things they don't want to hear. Now, hopefully you can do that without being insufferable about it. Uh, and I will leave it to others to judge whether I have succeeded uh, in that ambition. Um, but it's important, I think, for um, the readers of the Washington Post to be uh, exposed to a conservative point of view. And it's important for readers of National Review um, on occasion to, to, to see a challenge you know, from within conservatism to whatever the reigning orthodoxy of, uh, of conservatism or of the Republican Party um, happens to be. Uh, the, the thing, uh, I guess one, one sort of last thing is, I, I think that um, you know, Robbie was talking about the, this sort of uh, assumption that there's only one reasonable point of view that intelligent people of goodwill could hold on, this, on a whole range of issues. And, um, and that, it seems to me, is very, very much worth challenging. Um, but you, you, you don't, I think, challenge it uh, either by just sort of giving in and muting those differences and not proclaiming them, or by presenting those views in as in, in, as in your face, provocative, uh, and unreasonable a way as possible. So that there is, I think, a kind of constant balancing act um, where uh, I feel as though sometimes I've done my job if I haven't necessarily persuaded somebody to come around to my point of view, but I have gotten them to think, huh, there's something to think about here. There is, there's, you can hold this view in a reasonable way. Um, and, uh, and I think you know, you, you've, you've opened their minds a little bit. And then you can close it again later. <laughs> batting in Lou Gehrig's position, Ryan Anderson. Ryan. Great, um, thank you. So I, I should start with an apology because I thought the title of this panel was when professors go woke and the center <laughs> survive. So I actually prepared a 45 minute lecture on like, <laughs> tactics for students on how to combat woke professors. But while the other three panelists were speaking, I came up with an alternative 10 minute um, set of remarks. So, so we're, we're much, much better. Um, and, and where I wanna start, it's kind of similar to um, how Kristen started with uh, you know, kind of sharing a personal story, because for me, this starts uh, 19 years ago uh, when I arrived at Princeton. So next year will be my um, 20th reunion. And I arrived at Princeton, and then the summer after my freshman year, President Bush signed his executive order on stem cells, which at the time was like the most controversial thing Republicans were doing. They were waging a war on science, and you regularly saw these headlines about that Republican war on science. And then a month later, the attacks of September 11th took place. Um, that was a Tuesday of my sophomore year, that Thursday morning, 9 a.m. Um, I was in, uh, I guess it was Makash 10, or no, maybe it was Makash 50 with Eric Gregory for uh, Christian Ethics in Modern Society. And the room was packed just like this, standing room only. And then two years later, um, the Goodridge decision in Massachusetts took place. The first time we had a state Supreme Court say that a constitution requires a new definition of what marriage is. And so for me, I was majoring in music at Princeton. Right? I came here um, to say, you know, what songs made me feel happy and which ones made me feel sad, and it was great. And then I have these three kind of existential um, events or, you know, big questions, questions about life and death, both at the beginning of life with bioethics, with stem cells, um, with killing and war, and then the very nature of the human family, the very nature of marriage. And what I discovered was, you know, my, my classmates in the music program, uh, my friends at Butler College in the dining hall, um, they couldn't even understand why I believed what I believed about the sanctity of life, or about just war theory, or about the nature of marriage. Um, and I discovered, you know, there was this one guy walking around campus in a three-piece suit, suit, wasn't Cornell, so there were two guys walking around <laughs> campus in a three-piece suit. One of them uh, was actually publishing, you know, really, really thoughtful scholarship um, about bioethics, about, uh, about marriage, 
I don't know if Robbie's ever published on Just War or not. I guess at one point you did have that Wall Street Journal op-ed on it. But, but so I discovered there was someone here who I could learn from. And then I just started having conversations with people, right? Because you know, it was like my classmates, my teammates. I played on the, um, the little person uh, football team, the sprint football team, <laughs> the, the 150s. Back in the day, I, they got up to 165 by the time I was playing. Um, and that's how I would say I um, discovered my vocation, um, which was to try to explain things that I thought were true to audiences that primarily did not agree with me. Um, and so one of the first law, I'm not a lawyer, but the first law review article I ever wrote uh, was co-authored with Robbie and with a classmate of mine, Sharif Gerges, titled What is Marriage? Published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. A few years later, that became a book. Um, then after we lost the marriage debate in the courts, I published a book titled The Fu uh, Truth Overruled, The Future of Marriage and Religious Freedom. Uh, then there was a book with Oxford University Press on religious liberty and discrimination, because all of these debates were now about the intersection of discrimination law and religious liberty. Uh, then a book, uh, which Amazon sold uh, for three years, uh, titled When Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Moment. And then about two years ago, Amazon disappeared uh, that book. Um, and then most recently, a book on abortion. And so it's actually remarkable that my abortion book, a pro-life book, is the least controversial <laughs> of my books. <laughs> um, which says something about the cultural moment we're, we're living in. Uh, but it also says like, all right, so we live in woke professions. Unfortunately, there were not many academics uh, willing to um, do these pieces of scholarship. Um, I was profiled at one point by the Washington Post during the Obergefell uh, court debates. And the guy said, look, we're, we're running a profile of Jim Obergefell. We want to run a profile of someone on the other side of this. Do you know any law professors we could interview? And I was like, well, none of them had outed themselves yet. And he's like, yeah, I've noticed that. Like, you know, when the amicus priest comes in, like, we're not getting many from partners at elite law firms. We're not getting many from uh, the law professors that we know are conservative. Um, and I think for many, the, the costs were just too high inside of um, uh, some of the academic profession, some of the legal professions, as Joel mentioned. So for me, I found it very liberating that I've made most of my career outside of woke professions, very similar to Ramesh. Uh, but with an intention of you know, trying to reach people who don't already uh, agree with me. Um, you know, limited success, uh, um, the amicus brief that I filed in uh, one of the gay marriage cases, the book that Robbie and I wrote and the other ones, were cited by both Alito and by Thomas. They were in dissenting opinions. Right? So uh, we didn't get to five, which is where we um, needed to go. Um, you know, I've been mocked on international TV. If you haven't watched the Piers Morgan interview, you know, make some popcorn, sit down, Google my name and Piers Morgan. It's must-see TV. Um, but I think the flip side of this is that there's also uh, people are hungry to hear people present a uh, truthful uh, argument without the caustic or bombast or um, squishing out, for lack of a better term. Right? And you see that, you know, look at the people in this auditorium. We have standing room only. Uh, people who want to hear dissenting viewpoints, um, they may or may not agree with us. They don't want the kind of like cable news uh, bombast. Um, let me say a little bit about some of those costs because you know, the question is, can you survive? I think the answer is going to be yes. But I think we should go a, a step deeper and can you thrive? Uh, and we should be kind of um, you know, eyes wide open on what some of the costs can be and not be Pollyannish uh, about it. Robbie and I disagree about this. Robbie thinks that when he retires or gets hit by a bus, Princeton will hire someone like him as his replacement. Uh, I, I don't foresee that, but Robbie, Robbie has more either hope or optimism or bourbon than I do. And, um, you know, so, so I, 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 we'll see what happens. Um, but I do think there, there'll be costs here uh, and that we should be um, uh, aware of those. So one is that, you know, I was, you know, catching up with Eric Gregory earlier today, and I wish that I had a university environment where someone like Eric would be my colleagues. You know, part about being in a think tank is it's not as intellectually diverse as a university. And the depth and the breadth of scholarship is not going to be as expansive uh, of necessity, right? Because you can't cover everything. We, we, we couldn't, I could not do enough fundraising to replicate what Princeton has built over the past 200 some years. And so um, you can survive as a dissenter, but you know, some of my, my academic life, my intellectual life is not going to be uh, as robust. I currently have one friend from high school who still speaks to me. And I was the president of my high school my senior year. Um, no, and it's like, it doesn't bother me nearly as much as it bothers my mom. Because like, you know, my parents, they sent all five of us to this school. And they paid tuition for 12 years. For, they paid 60 years worth of tuition at this school. And when the Washington Post published that uh, profile of me, 
it was a front page Washington Post story. The, the Friends School of Baltimore posted it to their Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And they even distanced themselves in the process. They said, Friends School teaches our graduates to think for themselves. Here are prof here's a profile of one of our alums. And by the end of the day, they had deleted the post and the head of the school issued an apology because alums were saying, well, you wouldn't post a profile to a racist alum. Mm -hmm. Why are you posting a link to a profile of a homophobic, bigoted alum? And the school bought that argument. Uh, and they didn't think at all, as like Joel pointed out, like, what does that mean for any conservative student who was attending that school? Are they not part of the school community? What does that mean for any conservative alums? I've discovered there's one of them. And you know, actually, he's not, he, he's just a fair-minded, open-minded uh, liberal, and we still, still talk. Um, all right, but then there are green shoots, um, and these are other areas where I think you could see thriving. The Madison program has now been replicated, um, not just across the Ivy League. There's the Foundation for Excellence in Higher Education that has you know, founded Madison-esque programs at all of the Ivy League schools, plus several others. These are now being established at public universities. Uh, so there's the Hamilton Society at the Univers University of Florida. Um, there's a Civic Center at University of Texas at Austin. And so they're creating enclaves uh, for dissenters within kind of blue universities. Um, that's a green shoot, you know, it's a seat at the table. There's also a threat there that you would just be part of a conservative ghetto, right? You're not part of the mainstream, you're not accepted on equal terms as the rest of the university. So we'll see how those play out. Um, Ivy League is also unfortunately discrediting its uh, currency, it's deflating its currency, <laughs> in, 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 along with other currencies that are being uh, deflated. Um, and so, uh, being a think tank scholar um, might actually be more valuable than being an Ivy League professor in, in the near future, uh, for the people who matter. I mean, I think we'll see certain presidential administrations that would rather have scholars at EPPC advising them uh, than professors from Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. Uh, and that's a, you know opportunity that you can survive and even thrive outside of the university, still with a serious intellectual life without embracing bombast without embracing kind of like own the lib Twitter uh, memes um, and be recognized by the people who matter within your uh, fields. And lastly, I'll just say, look, I think there's a, a, a hunger out there with the American people um, for truth tellers that can do it with civility. I mean, I think it's why Robbie is so popular even at a place like Princeton. Right? Robbie is one of those teachers who um, uh, will speak the truth but will never say anything that's um, uncharitable. And I think there is an audience for that still in the United States. And so dissenters, if they embody that, not only can we survive, but we can thrive. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Ryan, as to the future of the Madison program uh, post Robbie, as you know, surely. I leave nothing to chance. <laughs> but you're against cloning. <laughs> <laughs> Panelists, uh, and let me begin actually with, with Kristen. Um, I think there's a deep problem. It, 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 it might not be a new problem. In fact, I think it's probably a very old problem with uh, young people coming in and with people generally, but you know, young people pick up what's in the culture with young people coming in, certainly many of the, the students I meet when they first walk in the door, a problem with people supposing that, honestly, at the end of the day, really, you cannot reason your way to conclusions or judgments about big, important, moral, and existential questions. That at the end of the day, what you've got is just a visceral gut position. And then all the talk, all the reason, so-called reasoning is just a rationalization for your visceral belief, which is probably be, to be accounted for sociologically. You know, it's because of what your family thought, it's because of what your religion touched, it's because of you know, the school you went to, it's because the circumstances in which you, uh, you grew up. And I myself see the, what I regard as the biggest victories for me as a teacher it doesn't matter where the student ends up, but when the student starts to think, gee, you know, it's possible for me to reason my way to a conclusion. And if that's true, that means I can actually question the beliefs I'm coming in here with. I can now ask myself, how did I get these beliefs? Right. 
Is it just tribal? Is it just the culture or subculture I was brought up in? Is it just Exeter and you know Greenwich, Connecticut, and right. you know whatever it is? Um, and then they start trying to think their way. And and when that happens, people sometimes change their minds. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they change their minds about some things. Don't change their minds about about other things. Chris, and I start with you because you yourself have had the experience of a personal, intellectual, and religious conversion. You think differently now than you did. And I think probably a lot of people in this audience, and I certainly have had that experience myself. But the initial challenge is to open students up to the possibility that you know we can actually reason our way to conclusions. We're not, we don't have to be slaves of the visceral gut instincts we have. What do you think about that? I mean, I totally agree, right? I mean, I think it's one of those things that when you, th I think about people ask me all the time, like you're a physician, didn't you have an understanding um, about these concepts that you so um, passionately believe in now that, you know, even, you know, I think sort of transcend or sort of can be come to a reason to outside of a religious perspective, right? That the science supports that human beings begin at fertilization. And I think most reasonable people would say that human beings have the right not to be killed at will and all of this, right? Um, and I, I think back, like, what, what were my arguments before around abortion? And it was rooted in this, like, deep-seated emotionality. And I really had never had the opportunity to have, through a culture of encounter, any exposure to the arguments around abortion. Um, Trisha Bruce at CUA did a study through Notre Dame that was published a few, or supported a few years ago that shows actually most US Americans have never really had an opportunity to thoughtfully converse about big topics like abortion. And it really was with the encounter of a Catholic moral theologian and his arguments in his book and in a relationship of us discussing Charles Camosi, who wrote Beyond the Abortion Wars, that my mind was changed about the reality of abortion. I do think, though, that there was something, again, also supernatural about that, because, again, I probably um, had had some um, probably like blinders on to those truths before that needed sort of a lifting of the scales off my eyes. I think that is somewhat supernatural also for me to really like embody them. But I do think that we do not provide in our universities opportunities through a culture of encounter for people to have conversations around the arguments about big topics. And I do think that one of the fruits of what happened with my situation this summer was, you know, you always hope that people engage with your work. And so after this story made national news, people started Googling my YouTube talks and my writings, and everyone sort of was like starting to engage with the stuff I hoped that they were to engage in. People messaged me on the side, and even people from like our PR department at Michigan that were assigned to help me manage the media stuff, they naturally looked up my work and they said, wow, you know, I've never really had an opportunity to think about things this way before, um, so thank you. So yes, yeah, so I do believe through a culture of encounter at hopefully our big institutions with uh, the arguments at hand um, in re culture of relationship building that we can encourage people to ask questions they probably never had the opportunity to ask before. I, I want to be clear that, um, at least in my experience, it's not that students come in and their minds are opened and they become conservatives necessarily. I've seen them go in the opposite direction. Sure. Students who come in with conservative views, but they're not well thought out conservative views. They have picked them up. They're visceral. They picked them up from their environment. And then they begin thinking about things and they reach the judgment they can actually reason, reason about these things. And, and then they reach what I think are the wrong conclusions. Yeah. <laughs> but they're thinking for themselves, right? So I've actually, that's a win. That's a victory for me because my job as a teacher is not to get students to agree with me. That's not my job. My job is to get them to think more deeply, more critically, always including self-critically, and for themselves. That's the victory. And every professor at this university should count that as the victory when the student is thinking more deeply, more critically for himself. Any, anything else on this uh, from the panelists? Yeah, I just yeah. one thing about that though. I think when they have this sense of younger people have the strong sense of belonging and this sense of like my group, right? To be othered because of the belief that then you might switch to, there's a strong inertia towards like not leaving your mob or not leaving your people. Um, so I think there's that inertia when, especially when sometimes these orthodoxies are so like culturally normative as part of a big place that the, the sort of the, the trend or the inkling to want to sort of leave that and explore something new, um, that there's a, I think there's maybe an incentive not to do that. Yeah, tribalism I think is a very powerful human thing. And, and just in itself, it's not a bad thing, you know, just in itself, but gosh, it can go haywire, can't it? 
and when we, we, we become tribalists and, and put the interests of the tribe above everything else, then that becomes a powerful disincentive to actual critical thinking, thinking for yourself. Because if you do think for yourself, no matter what your tribe is, sometimes tribe's going to be wrong. If you think of yourself, sometimes you're going to come to a different place. Ramesh, you were talking about this uh, in writing for conservative audiences. So, you know, National Review, there are a few liberal readers who want to know what the other side's thinking, but most of the readers are conservative. And sometimes you say things they don't want to hear, as you said. Yes, and, and, and always have. We lost a third of our subscribers by taking on the John Birch Society in the, in the 1960s, for example. I just I wanted to pick up that thread about reason, because I think we don't think about it often enough, how that that basic belief in the limited but real autonomy of reason yeah. and, it, and, the, and its dignity. Um, there's a long tradition of skepticism of it from the right, from conservatives, from religious conservatives in particular, who've tended to think sometimes, some types of conservatives, of reason as being fatally weakened by sin. Um, and you know, I think Emmy Bradford wrote a book, uh, Better Guide Than Reason, which was about tradition being something to, was more trustworthy than it ought. But it, in our contemporary context, it seems to me, we no longer live in a kind of age of reason where, um, where reason and enlightenment are kind of associated with progressives and the skeptics are, uh, are all on the right. But if, if anything, it's more like an age of feelings. And, um, uh, and, and it's, it, it tends to be, although it isn't exclusively, certainly, uh, conservatives who, who believe that reason can arrive at more than merely instrumental conclusions, but actually conclusions about the good life. Yeah, you know, sometimes, uh, I agree with that, that sometimes historians uh, will break up the epochs into the age of this and the, and the age of that. So, you know, they, they sometimes call the medieval period, the Middle Ages, uh, the medieval period, the age of faith. And, um, you know, that's, that's oversimplifying. But there's some truth to it, uh, you know, with the great theologians, Muslim, Jewish, Christian of the, of the period and great religious institutions of the period, the, the touchstone of truth, of justice, of rightness, of, of goodness was largely faith. Now, any, anybody who's read the great thinkers of the three traditions knows that it was also an age of reason. It wasn't as if faith had pushed reason completely out of the way. If, if that's what you think, you need to read some medieval philosophy. But there's still some truth in the idea that the medieval period was the age of faith. And then the Enlightenment, what do we call that? What do historians call that? Well, they call that the age of reason, sometimes the age of science. And again, the idea is, it's oversimplified, but there's some truth in it, that, that the touchstone of truth, of rightness, of goodness is, you know, standing up to the test of rationality, of scientific inquiry and scrutiny, rational critical evaluation uh, and uh, assessment. Not that religion was pushed out of the way. Some of the greatest Enlightenment thinkers were very religious people. But there's some truth in it. But then I ask myself, well, if the medieval period was the age of faith, if the Enlightenment was the age of reason, what age do we live in? And I think Ramesh has hit the nail on the head. We live in the age of feeling. What's the touchstone of truth, of justice, of goodness? feeling, how I feel about it. It's that visceral sense that I was talking about, what, 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 what people rely on when they think you can't really reason your way to judgments about fundamental things. You just have these visceral ones. But if that's true, here's the, here's the dark side of believing that. If that's true, if we really can't reason about these things ultimately, then you've got your visceral core based judgment on the big important questions on which people disagree. You've got yours and I've got mine. And we can't reason together. That's pointless. How are we going to solve this thing? Power. It's all then just a quest for power. Um, with that, I think let's open the floor because I'd love to get some participation from, uh, from the alumni and friends. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm, go I'm, going to, I'm going to recognize the lady right in the middle with the white hat on uh, first. Oh. There we go. And uh, Mike Schmidt here has got a microphone for you. There we go. I'm not an alum. Full disclosure. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your perspectives today. Um, I had an interesting experience in January 19, no, I'm sorry, 2017, uh, where I sat down with 12 Republicans and 12 Democrats and had the most enlightening conversation about politics. Regular people right off the street. The program was monitored or moderated by two marriage counselors. 
<laughs> we're laughing. So one, both of them, one a Republican, one a Democrat, were good friends. Both of them had gone through Thanksgiving hell, okay, right after the election. And they called each other and they said, what is going, I'm a marriage counselor, I know how to talk with people. How did this happen? Because both of them just completely lost it. And it occurred to them that what they needed to do in that situation is use all their marriage counseling skills to get people not to talk, but to listen. Yeah, yeah. And come into a conversation with no preconceived ideas about doing anything. Because the only time anybody can change anybody else is when they're in diapers. <laughs> so what we can do for each other is give people things to think about. Not right then, but it will come to you. You think about this stuff over time. But just being able to open your mind to a different way of thinking. Nobody changed political parties after that, but everybody left saying, you know, I learned something tonight. Yeah, that's a lovely, lovely story. Lovely. Yeah, yeah. There is an organization called Braver Angels that is doing, you've heard of their work? Doing programs like this all around the country. If you haven't had a chance to participate, this is one of the things you can do to help bridge this divide. That learning how to listen and learning how to express yourself in a way that's not intimidating. Mm -hmm. so Good. Yeah, thank you. So the, the great um, jurist, learned hand, he was the greatest American judge not to end up on the Supreme Court. Everybody thought he would. He never made it. But he was a very distinguished uh, jurist and, and a learned man, learned hand. Um, but he once said that the spirit of liberty is a spirit of not being too sure you're always right. And I think that's also the spirit of truth seeking, not being absolutely so cocksure you're always right that the other guy doesn't have something maybe to be said for his point of view. Also, the spirit of truth-seeking is the spirit of listening, not just hearing. It's one thing to have civility in the watered-down sense. I sit quietly while you talk, then you sit quietly. We don't interrupt each other. We're civil. Our mothers are pleased. But that's is the difference between hearing, sitting quiet, and listening. And I think the spirit of truth-seeking really is a spirit of listening. Do the panelists have, yeah, Ryan Anderson? Yeah, so I, I have um, two thoughts in reaction to that. Um, and just by preface, uh, David Blankenhorn, the founder of Braver Angels, they really do good work, and um, so thank you for mentioning that. And the two thoughts I had was, one, um, when I was doing a lot of college uh, speaking, um, and, and it's actually, it's, it's a downside that I don't do as much college uh, speaking because for me, you know, being treated like Judge Kyle Duncan is treated just isn't worth it. Um, to, to, to borrow a phrase, the juice isn't worth the squeeze to be um, <laughs> protested like that. And, and that's a shame because like, when, when I was doing a lot of uh, campus speaking uh, on the marriage debate in particular, I would have students come up to me afterwards. Um, and one message was from conservative students saying like, thank you, like, I believed marriage is a unit of husband and wife because the Bible says so, but I never had reasons for it. And they were for the first time actually integrating faith and reason, and that's one response. The more interesting response to me was the liberal students who would say, I always thought people like you were bigots, and now I see the issues actually more complicated. I had never heard, and these are like students at elite law schools, I have never heard an argument for why the Constitution might not require a new definition of marriage before you. Like one, that's a you know, shameful condemnation on the state of our uh, education, that you could be you know, a 3L and have never even heard the opposing argument. Um, but true, like what that is, that would lower temperatures of debates. If you think your opponent is not just wrong, but evil, you will view them differently than if you think they're a good person, but they're misguided, right? And so, so like, you know, this is kind of a accusation of myself. I should do more campus speaking despite the cost because it's actually important. A uh, second thing is we should all think about what these devices are doing um, to our discourse. Because everything that Braver Angels would do in having a sit down, face to face conversation, what that incentivizes in terms of dispositions and virtues and values, these devices cultivate the exact opposite. Because the algorithm is tweaked to get us to say the most outlandish thing, because that'll get us the most likes, the most retweets, and that'll get us on cable news. And, and so I think we also need to think about like, are we controlling technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis discussion, or are we allowing our technology to actually shape how we engage in these things. 
you know, Better Angels, uh, Braver Angels was originally called Better Angels, if I remember correctly. And of course, that recalls Abraham Lincoln's famous line from the first, first inaugural address, when he's trying desperately to talk the South out of secession, mm -hmm. which he knew would require a response from him in a, in a civil war. And he's, he's, he's pleading with them. And, and he, he, he hopes for the day when the better angels of our nature will enable us to sit down and reason this thing out rather than coming to arms. And then I, I think what happened is it turned out that another organization had already taken the name Better Angels, so they renamed themselves Braver Angels. But that makes sense, too, because I think today it does take, isn't this weird, it takes courage to say, let's stop demonizing each other and just, you know, sit down and reason reason together. I mean, we can be tough and aggressive and state our positions firm, but, but without, you know, without thinking each, the other guy's some sort of monster. Uh, yes, Micah, yes. You know, I believe in this stuff. I was the coordinator of the Progressive Review while being your research assistant on your book about natural law. So, I'm down. Guess what I would ask the panel is, oh, well, how do you wrestle intellectually with the fact that there are different kinds of opinions, right? We're not saying, what is the appropriate marginal tax rate? You know, is it 45% or 35%? These are fundamental issues of identity where people believe, if they are trans, et cetera, that you're actually saying you don't have the right to exist. No, no, no. You, who yeah. has oh, ever oh. said that? You do not have the right to exist. OK. How do you wrestle intellectually with the fact that there are different, this is a fair question. There are different kinds of yeah. issues. Like, for example, should you be civil about your views on abortion? Mm -hmm. If you genuinely believe of a pro-life position, it's not clear to me that civility is the appropriate approach. So I'm not making a liberal or conservative point. There are different kinds of issues. So if I could tackle that one. I don't think that there's any absolute principle that um, you have to tolerate uh, in the sense of giving a platform to or, or um, inviting somebody to, to, to speak on your campus, et cetera, et cetera to any point of view. Um, there's no, I don't, you don't have to so find out if there's still a, a working National Socialist Workers Party in our country and in, invite them to speak, um, for example. Uh, so I think, I think a lot of our debates about cancel culture and toleration and so forth uh, go awry because we try to find some principle like that that we can adhere to uh, in an absolute way. Whereas I think the truth of the matter is that what we want is a kind of disposition uh, of, of openness a, that is exercised with good judgment. Uh, and it, it seems to me that the, the question you should be asking about a particular debate about, um, you know, should this person, how should we feel about this person speaking in this context? Uh, would be, A, can an intelligent person of goodwill hold this view? Uh, and I think that just sort of defini definitionally all live issues in a society um, can, uh, you, the various points of view on it can be held by intelligent people of goodwill. Now that's a culturally contingent um, set of opinions because the set of opinions that meet that test now are different than the set of opinions that would meet that test in the 1950s, for example. We would not have a debate about should we have racial segregation uh, and enforced white supremacy where, you know, in a way that debate was kind of inescapable and had to be had uh, at that time. Um, but, but, but I think that the key thing is to ask the, qu ask the question I said, can this view be held by an intelligent person of goodwill? And then B, exercise charity uh, and humility when you're providing an answer to that question. And then I, and I think that can, that can help resolve a great deal of these, dis uh, a great many of these disputes. Joel? I just wanted to jump in on this. I, I, think, that, I think it's a great question, um, and, and, and as you said, a fair question. Um, the, I, I agree with, with Ramesh's answer, and I would just make two quick points. One, the answer to the question cannot be, um, I draw the line according to the degree of uh, harm that I perceive to result from your point of view. Because that's just collapsing this kind of uh, broader question about methodology of debate 
into the merits of the debate and just saying that uh, because I disagree with you, therefore I can shut you down. <laughs> and like that, that, then that's not really a principle at all that, that, that allows for debate. But the second point I'd make is actually I think your example is a really good one that I have used with my friends where you know, I, I have you know, a lot of my close friends in law school uh, were on the far left. And, uh, and to their great credit, a lot of them uh, were willing to engage with me in a, in a very respectful way on questions of marriage and, and some of these other live uh, debates, especially when I was in law school, they were live debates. Um, and one of the points I would always make to them whenever they started to get kind of upset about you know, my views on this and, get, and it got more heated is I would just point out, look, uh, from my point of view as somebody who's pro-life, your view uh, supports a regime that has led to the killing of tens of millions of innocent people since 1973, right? And yet, despite that horrifying outcome, right, I am willing to accord to you the respect of, of, listening, of listening to you, uh, and listening, not just hearing you, uh, and engaging with you in good faith, because I know that the reason you hold your view isn't because you're some sort of evil, malicious person, uh, but because you have made a mistake. Like, you, 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 are, you are just wrong about this, right? And being wrong doesn't make you bad. Um, and, uh, that, and so the, I'm not going to dismiss you as a person or say you can't, we can't be friends uh, or shut you down for that. Um, and as Robbie said, I also have to hold open, I always, always have to hold open the possibility that I'm the one who's wrong, right? And so therefore that engagement with that debate is important for me too. Uh, and usually when, when you put it in those terms on the pro, from the pro-life perspective, uh, it does tend to, to cause some people on the left to kind of come up short and realize like, yeah, from my point of view, you're sanctioning the deaths of a lot of people and, and, and I still, we can still have a respectful disagreement about this. I rather like it that the United States is a republic, and I rather like the idea of civil liberties, basic freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, the press, freedom of assembly, right to petition the government. So in a pluralistic republic, democratic republic if you prefer, uh, what do we owe each other? What do we owe each other? We don't owe each other to be right about everything. <laughs> I think we owe it to each other to be honest with each other and to engage with each other in a truth-seeking spirit. Not to be demagogues, not to be manipulators, but truth-seeking spirit. And I think that means that we need to be willing to engage with others honestly in a truth-seeking spirit without trying to shut them down, cancel them, marginalize them, smear and demean them, if they are willing to do business in the proper currency of intellectual discourse. There's a currency of intellectual discourse just as there's an economic currency. It's pounds and pence in Britain, it's dollars and cents here. The currency of intellectual discourse consists of reasons, arguments, and evidence. That's all I can ask legitimately of a person with whom I'm having a disagreement about politics or morality or religion, what is it, whatever it is, that they do business in that currency. And that is why I do the following. Every few years, the disability rights movement descends on Princeton. Lots of people in their wheelchairs, lots of people with serious disabilities. And they come here to protest my colleague, Peter Singer. Peter Singer is regarded as a great enemy by the disability rights movement because of his views on personhood. As you may know, Professor Singer believes not only that abortion is morally acceptable, but that infanticide even of a healthy infant, uh, because he doesn't believe that, um, that you're a person until a certain, number of, a certain period of time after birth. And by the same token, he believes that people suffering from serious dementias, for example, or other significant cognitive abilities lack the qualities that make you a person. Now, if you know anything about me, you know that's as far from my position as you could possibly get. If there's a colleague with whom I disagree more on this campus than Peter Singer, I don't know who that is, and yet when the disability rights people come and they chain themselves in their wheelchairs to the Nassau Hall gates, and uh, they demand uh, that President Eisgruber, or before him, President Tillman, or President Shapiro, revoke Professor Singer's tenure and fire him, I am always the first guy in line to defend Professor Singer's right to speak his mind. Now, I do that not because I have a purely abstract belief in freedom of speech. I do believe in freedom of speech, especially in an academic setting. 
but it's not a mere abstract belief. And I certainly don't do it because I need to protect him so that they don't come after me next. They're gonna come after me anyway, so I don't care. <laughs> I do it for this reason. Professor Singer is not a demagogue. He is not a hater. He is not a bigot. He does business in the proper currency of intellectual discourse, giving reasons, making arguments, uh, providing evidence, which is why I encourage my students to take his courses. And he encourages his students to take my courses because he too shares the belief that the way you advance knowledge, the way you get toward the truth of things, it's not by shouting each other, manipulating each other and so forth. It's by providing students with the best that can be thought and said on the, all sides, on the competing sides of any particular question. And I think that what, what I'm trying to do there is I think exactly what we owe to each other as citizens. End of sermon. Uh, uh, yeah, Professor, uh, Dr. Zach, Dr. Zach. Thank you, Robin. thank you all. Um, I just want to say uh, something briefly to try to bring together your negative feelings about the age of feelings and positive feelings about the age of reason. Uh, I think we're conflating good reason with truth, uh, seeking truth or falsity. Uh, as I'm sure most people know, you can have a perfectly valid argument which goes from one step to another absolutely correctly, and yet if you start off with premises with which you disagree, that argument does not lead to something that will convince you. Uh, and at least in my mind, my sincerely humble opinion, ethical, moral uh, issues are not matters of finding truth. They're matters of starting with basic premises, basic assumptions that you can indeed come to from many ways, from feelings, from evolution, from the way your parents taught you, from the way your culture teaches you, and then going from there with a correctly valid form of reasoning to find your conclusions. And for someone, if you have incorrect reasoning, someone can point that out. But the way to change your mind is to change your assumptions. Not to say that you are wrong, that you have, uh, you have come to an untruth, uh, that we've been using the words right and wrong and truth, but that we have different perspectives and different points of view. And I so much appreciate the fact that we're emphasizing the need to respect others uh, who do have different opinions. So Brian, this is a, an argument that Dr. Zach uh, and I have been having for a long time. It's about how far down you can actually reason about things. Uh, is reasoning strictly uh, restricted to the logical, uh, the chain of logical inferences, or can you reason about fundamental premises? Dr. Zach thinks you can't. I think that you can, and the debate goes on. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, right in the middle, uh, in the in the, in the back. Yes, you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, uh, Michael, bring you a, a microphone. So I am a parent of a graduating senior this year, and I'm also a former teacher. And I just wanted to bring up, you know, one of the things that has been of concern to me as I've watched and raised our children over the years. And it has to do with a statement that my dad said. He was a school superintendent for a couple decades, and he said that the legislation, no child left behind, was the worst thing that ever happened to the country. Because it required teachers to teach to the test, which required them to tell children what to think and not how to think. And I, I would say that we have lived that reality. Whatever uh, powers of intellectual vigor uh, actually happened at home. And you're seeing a lot of parents now taking your kids out of public schools uh, and doing homeschooling for that very reason, um, to give them an opportunity to engage in a, a broader array of intellectual discourse. And so my question for you is, um, are there any plans for the James Madison program to begin to engage with K through 12 through outreach um, so that they're not getting it in the schools. Uh, I can attest to that. Um, they're not getting civics. They're getting history. But oftentimes those, that history is tainted 
by whatever political state they're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, if there is any desire uh, for the James Madison program to create K through 12 outreach programs, I, I know that I would have received it wholeheartedly. And, um, and I just thank you for everything that you're doing. Well, thank you. Um, I'll tell you, I, I've been extremely impressed by the students. Now, of course, it's a, it's a small sample, so I'm not going to generalize, but I'm extremely ex impressed by the students that I've had who've been homeschooled. I guess there must be great material out there, probably online, on the internet, for families to use, because I guess the homeschool movement is now a pretty well-developed uh, thing. And uh, the kids are incredibly well educated. And I don't see any social problems. I, I remember the old knock against homeschooling was the kids won't learn how to socialize uh, properly. But the homeschooled kids, and again, it's a small sample, so maybe, maybe it tells only a fraction of the story. Homeschooled kids seem to be doing really well. The, um, the kids from these new classical schools, um, relatively new classical schools, often they're Christian classical schools, sometimes they're secular uh, Catholic schools. They're very impressive as well. Some of the kids from the Jewish day schools, outstanding. Uh, it gets more mixed, in my experience, with the parochial schools, and very, very mixed with the public schools, very, very mixed with the famous elite uh, private schools like the New England boarding schools and the famous New York City private schools, very, very mixed indeed. Uh, so just from my perspective as somebody who teaches kids coming in from all these different backgrounds, I'm, I'm really impressed with the homeschoolers and the classical schoolers and the Jewish day schoolers. Uh, that looks to me like the way to go. Now as far as, um, as far as the Madison program is concerned, we can't do everything, <laughs> but we do try to do our, our bit. We do have summer programs for high school students. Uh, so does the Witherspoon Institute here in town, which is not part of Princeton University. It's an independent uh, think tank that a number of people, including myself, associated with the Madison program uh, are associated uh, with. Uh, and they have outstanding summer programs for high school uh, students. There are summer seminars. The kids come in for, I don't know, seven or eight or nine days. Luis Tellez, who's president of the Witherspoon Institute, is here with us, and he can tell me if I've gotten this wrong. I think it's six or seven or eight or nine, nine days. Uh, and those are great. We've also run, and Brad Wilson can correct me if I'm wrong about this, I think we are going to be running again, some programs for high school teachers? Yes, uh, both students and teachers. Oh, it's for high school students and high school teachers. you know anything about me or anything about the program, you, you know that the thing we are totally against is indoctrination. Don't do it, won't do it, won't tolerate others uh, doing it. Robbie. Um, but the problem right now that I'm seeing is kids come in indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. and, and then you got the whole problem of trying to open people's minds so that you can actually get them thinking critically about stuff. Did, did Kristen just, weigh in there? I just Grant? wanted to add that yeah. because I feel I'd be abdicating my responsibility if I didn't um, that, that high school is not too early and it is never too late to have a subscription to National Review. <laughs> <laughs> but but, there, but there's, something, there's something going on. There's something going on in too many schools that results in them coming to college with too narrow and restricted a vision. Uh, with, with, with questions that really are open and have been open since Socrates, closed. Closed in the sense that they don't want to hear a question about it. They don't want to hear a dissent from it. They don't want to hear the possibility that it might be, be wrong. And, and, and obviously, we, that's a problem that just gets put into our lap as university teachers. You know, we, we didn't create that. Well, well maybe we did indirectly. <laughs> 
but you know, it comes to us, and then we have to deal with the, with the reality. Abigail, was your hand up? Abigail Anthony, yeah. Ramesh. <laughs> so I think, I think a lot of companies are recalculating right now. They thought that the path of least resistance was this way, and it turns out that there's more resistance um, than they thought. Um, I think a large part of the problem we've had over the last um, few years in this department is that we've had this kind of, we've had this geographic polarization, educational polarization, and age polarization all happening simultaneously. And so if you're a big company that wants to hire recent college graduates in uh, big metro areas, um, you're going to have a very left-wing pool of, uh, of labor supply. Uh, and a lot of these places thought, well, conservatives, they may complain, they may grumble, but ultimately politics is less important to them and they'll go along and we can cater to this uh, element without paying a price. Uh, I think we are beginning to see a, a reaction to that and hopefully that um, is going to change. I think that this is not the first time, you know, the, the Bud Light, I mean, there it probably would have helped to have a good product. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think uh, the companies that tried to fight Governor Kemp in Georgia over voting rights um, did not succeed and, and, and suffered from, uh, from doing that. Of course, you have the Disney situation in Florida. We can argue about some of the, the details of, of how that fight has played out. Um, but, I, but I think you'd be crazy, and I think you'd be probably violating your fiduciary responsibilities um, if you didn't take into account uh, the fact that there is a real a limit to uh, the customer base's tolerance. Uh, we're going to have time, I think, uh, Debbie, am I right? Oh, we don't have time. We have to abandon, we have to give up the room. Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>